مرحبا Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Zika House. I, my name is uh, Rima Maghrabi. I'm the director of uh, Shark um, for Intellectual Development. Um, together with uh, my um, colleague Alexander Sandals, um, a Swedish journalist, have been um, hosting uh, during the past year a series of um, uh, conferences and uh, dialogue series revolving around um, uh, freedom and uh, the freedom of expression. Today, um, we have uh, two. Um, dialogue sessions that are held um, at the same time. Uh, Alexandra is holding a dialogue in Sweden, and I have uh, my own uh, gathering with you here. In uh, Sweden, they are talking about the impact of migration on the intellect of uh, Syrians. And here we'll be talking about um, the, um, uh, of course, about um, the freedom of expression and shifting boundaries during times of conflict. Uh, the leading discussions um, will be held with Ms. This is Nada Abdul Samad, journalist at BBC, Mr. Ayman Hanna from the Samarika Sears Foundation, and the photojournalist Amar Abd Rabbu. As usual, we shall start with a series of questions that I will be asking uh, to the different speakers. Then we will uh, hand you over the floor. I shall start today with Ayman. How would you define freedom of expression, Ayman? This is actually a general question. The freedom of expression means that individuals have the right um, to write, to, to um, express, um, to take photos of his or her own opinion, to express um, the change of creed or to express uh, changing opinions without having any other entity or any other party that is exerting any kind of pressure or of uh, coercion against him intellectually or physically and without subjecting him to any physical uh, harm or imposing him to uh, legal or social boundaries that, that could um, impede any communication of such an idea um, to the public. Any idea, says Reem, because even in democratic countries, they have boundaries for freedom of expression. Of course, freedom ends when the freedom of the other party starts. However, the problem that you are encountering in our region is that we are trying to um, reinterpret uh, the um, sentence I just mentioned um, in order to say that uh, my freedom ends when the creed or when the um, when the creed of the other starts. I have the right to say that I do not believe in the creed of that other person and that this is a creed that I could and that I would like to confront using any specific means. It's not against um, any faith to actually express oneself against the faith or against the creed of another person. Of course, there are boundaries uh, to express uh, or to have him express his freedom of faith. However, the other boundaries pertaining to the freedom of expression are related to the interpretation protocol of Article 9 um, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which stipulates the following. The boundaries may be imposed first if um, the uh, following criteria are available, if they are established in the law, if the law is drafted by means of a very transparent and fully democratic means and uh, to have such boundaries expressed in, in their narrow sense, um, which means, uh, of course, um, our um, national or our nation, of course, they can go depleted at any time and only um, uh, any co and um, uh, confessional issues or anything that could um, affect them in relationships with the brother countries. All those um, stereotyped expressions are rejected. Third, if I am accused of having conducted anything that could lead to any coercion against my freedom. I must not express uh, my um, innocence. Uh, the other party is supposed to prove my, um, uh, to, to prove, of course, my criminal intent. If I call for um, violence or for any um, um, extremism or discrimination, for example, in Rwanda, there was, of course, a radio that has called people and provoked people to commit to violence and homicides. Therefore, the party that is accusing me of um, conducting any irrelevant or unacceptable uh, crime is supposed to, to prove that I have committed such a crime and to cr prove my criminal intent. So it's very difficult and we need to have um, a, a law that is actually established by the law and the crime is well defined, well specified. In addition to proving the criminal intent, 
by the accusing party using, of course, a legal procedure that is very transparent and that provides for the right of defense. It's only then, and when all those criteria are compounded, compounded um, can the authority impose um, a boundary to the freedom of expression. When any of the fourth criteria are not uh, satisfied, I, as an individual and as a representative of a foundation, uh, stand for the freedom of expression and say that it is violated. Many journalists during the four past years in Arab countries have been working towards and thriving towards uh, upholding um, such freedoms. Um, for uh, Syria, Amar, how do you see that the expression has changed um, in Syria in terms of quality and quantity, in terms of opinion, of course, uh, counting um, the past um, four years? Of course, I believe that there is a paramount uh, difference. If we speak um, in terms of media, in terms of until, uh, in terms of art, um, because when we speak about culture, culture, of course, they um, takes no boundaries. Uh, you all know how the official uh, Syrian media um, used um, to be implemented. For example, it was um, a mere caricature. We see that uh, the president had welcomed X, Y, or Z, and those matters that would not communicate to the people, and uh, the news bulletin would only relate to what uh, the president activities were. Of course, uh, this has been depleted today in the um, revolutionary media, as mentioned by media. Um, there could be, of course, uh, some obstacles or some um, bumps in any uh, media, but today, of course, we can witness a more uh, eloquent media. Even the persons that um, could be uh, the worst, uh, for, such as, for example, Zahran Alush or the Islamic um, um, armies, uh, demonstrations are taking place on a daily basis against them, uh, calling for, for example, the return, the return of the kidnapped, which was actually silent in Syria. I can give you, I'm telling you about Syria, but I can give you the example about um, Libya. Uh, before 2011, that was impossible in Libya. We couldn't, uh, in Syria, sorry. And uh, for example, in Syria, the issue of the kidnapped or of the disappeared is not something uh, that is um, uh, totally irrelevant. All people know the tragedy behind it um, from an autistic point of view as well. There has been, of course, an explosion in all arts um, from the um, wall graffitis. If you walk down the streets in Syria today, in Libya as well, you will see graffitis that are very varied, that are very creative. In Egypt as well. Of course, in Egypt, uh, the uh, revolution is a bit um, special. I will not, of course, uh, dig into the um, Egyptian example, but in Syria and in Libya, of course, uh, there is much um, expression. There is um, a high quality of um, graffiti expression. So I do think that there is a quantum leap, and that there is a major change. And there is, of course, a difference from night to day. Now, how do you actually um, assess the experience that we are going through as Syrians inside and outside um, our countries and the experience um, that uh, the Lebanese had um, gone through during, of course, uh, the Lebanese war. Of course, democracy changed, um, the overall ambiance changes, but the change in terms of the freedom of expression or the opportunities for expression during um, the civil war in Lebanon and during the war currently in Syria. How can you compare between the two? Uh, speaking about uh, freedom um, is to be related to a demographic um, or to a geographic location. Can we say about the freedom of expression now in Syria? No, because we do not have any location where you can express yourself, uh, neither among uh, the, uh, the regime-controlled um, areas nor among uh, the opposition-controlled um, areas. Now, the activities that we are witnessing, uh, the e-news, uh, the e-videos, um, maybe um, Without such electronic devices or electronic um, uh, expressions, we wouldn't have known what's happening. Because when we talk about freedom, it has to be intrinsically related to a geographic space. Um, uh, so if you go to Lebanon and you express yourself, it's one thing. And uh, to go to, Le to Syria and to be capable of expressing yourself is something completely different. We are talking about a change in terms of the product, in terms of the outcome, and not a change when it comes to the definition of freedom of expression per se. Now, uh, the uh, Syrian media resembles us. 
It resembles us in terms of our civil war because now the uh, Syrian media has um, undertaken a civil war. And I think that the freedom of expression is not only related to you expressing your own opinion, but it's about having the capacity to embrace the opinion of uh, the other. And this is something that we cannot witness on a constant basis. Um, I can give you the example of Lebanon because I am Lebanese. And here, of course, I'm speaking my capacity as a Lebanese journalist and not um, as a representative of my institution. But I would like to say that the freedom of expression starts um, by accepting the opinion of um, the other. Similarly, as much as you expect uh, to have your opinion be accepted uh, without uh, convincing and uh, to have um, your opinion be respected. So I think that there is actually a civil war in terms of uh, media in the Syrian media. There is uh, actually um, a specific speech. There is, of course, a communitarian speech. There are some things that I'm following. There are some um, uh, e-news bulletins that I'm following, which I will not mention. During, of course, this period of oppression, this oppression has actually outbursted, and it is now reflecting reality. And it resembles this reality that I am criticizing in terms of accusing the other of corruption, of um, being unfaithful, and of being a traitor. I think that uh, in the alternative Syrian uh, media, there is today a civil war outside the boundaries that is actually unleashed by this medium. To comment on what Ayman said, if I'm saying that the freedom of expression is related to accepting the opinion of the other and to have it um, be accepted equally to your right to express yourself, then the freedom of expression needs to be understood within a specific context or within a specific geography. I personally stand in favor of imposing boundaries on the media. I am not in favor of any uh, total freedom being granted to the media. Maybe many persons would not accept my opinion. In a country such as Lebanon, there is actually an undeclared civil war. There is a communitarian speech in the media that could lead to a civil war or at least would lead uh, to actually a, a larger gap I am imposing no boundaries on such a communitarian speech. It is not allowed to have our TVs become actually a tribune for a communitarian speech and not, of course, um, politicians. Um, um, and if uh, politicians uh, have uh, such um, a speech that will go to any uh, media institution, but uh, to have the institution per se express um, a communitarian speech. For example, on uh, May 7, for example, New TV has uh, mentioned a communitarian uh, problem or a conflict between some Shia and some Sunni um, young persons, which has led the um, Shia young persons actually attack the Sunni region and they had actually disagreed on the parking lot and no one had understood the opinion of that other. So this is just to make a very long story short. A boundary sometimes or boundaries are sometimes um, necessary. For example, in Europe, they impose boundaries when it comes to mentioning racism. So boundaries can be two-shaped. We can either have an early censorship or it can be a transparent, uh, subsequent uh, legal attitude. So my problem is with the pre-censorship because we need someone to be entrusted with such a pre-censorship. Is it the National Council for the Media? Or is it the Minister of the Media? Which I do hope will not um, be involved even if they are doing something positive because we have seen the consequences of their involvement. As for having a legal and clear uh, mechanisms for um, accountability and that will of course um, um, actually uh, prohibit uh, such interventions then we can discuss uh, the legal um, issues with legal boundaries um, maybe um, this uh, could be uh, well sensitive now regarding of course the, the, the of course the Lebanese issue is not your issue but um, it doesn't start with a censorship being a pre or a later censorship. It starts uh, with um, not providing any uh, permits uh, to the media. Apparently, you are uh, distressed with what that was mentioned. When you link the freedom of expression to a geographic space, um, this is uh, something that I'm afraid from, honestly. During uh, lunches and dinners, I hear many people saying that our um, people do not know, are not ready for the freedom of expression, are not mature enough. So when will such people be mature enough? First of all, they have regimes that can do anything in order to diminish the capacities of such um, populations in order to limit uh, their, uh, their thinking. Um, this was not what I meant. 
says uh, Mrs. Nada. I think that our people are actually uh, ready to have uh, such freedom and such democracy. We are talking about the freedom of expression. I personally prefer to say that uh, free Syrians um, are free outside Syria, but they are not free uh, inside Syria. This is actually a second issue on which I wanted to have some reservations. Uh, I have given you some examples, but uh, there are over 500 new Syrian publications. I do hope that uh, you are saying what you're saying after having examined or that after you had visited Syria, but I can assure you that we have a true freedom that was actually surprising to me as well in terms of opening, in terms of paying in terms of um, photography. A couple of days ago, I was uh, speaking to a photographer uh, from Reuters. His name is Amar, and who is actually uh, working with Jabhat al-Nusra. And Jabhat al-Nusra never asks him uh, to show it, um, uh, the pictures that it's taking. And uh, they are being, uh, and he's being granted the freedom that he's not granted in any other, uh, in any other Arab countries. So uh, some, for example, magazines have been uh, stopped at the frontiers, even uh, when uh, there was actually solidarity with Charlie Hebdo. Um, and after such censorship, um, and I believe that such censorship uh, that is taking place afterwards is as well a healthy element. Now, let us understand the impact of the West um, on uh, the freedom on freedom we have actually compared the expressions that are being formulated from within syria and uh, with the syrians um, coming from abroad in terms of quality of quantity and of uh, authenticity i think that we cannot uh, differentiate between what's inside and what's outside all the syrians that are outside and that are in support of the revolution offer the rebels a new dimension, professionalism, languages, communication with the world. So they offer them many, many things that are not available to the people who are inside. And the people who are inside offer us who are outside authenticity, as well as the daily experience, what's happening on a daily basis, um, hope and resistance against uh, the most cruel means of oppression, bombarding. This is why I'm not happy to differentiate between the two. Of course, um, one can complete the other. As I have already said more than once, um, I have uh, gone to the freed areas, and I like to use the word freed. And not once did anyone actually tell me, you are coming from outside or you are away from the revolution. Never. Which I sometimes read in the, um, in the news, saying that there is some kind of differentiation. However, this does not translate into any facts on the ground, because they aspire towards uh, such um, external support. And uh, we who are outside require their presence um, and their endurance. This is why I do not think that there is any confrontation. That's excellent, Reem says. I do hope that we will all be working towards a full freedom. Now, Amar says that there is freedom inside Syria. However, we have heard a lot about some journalists, some intellectuals who have been threatened, who have um, faced many obstacles. Um, what do you think, Ayman, or according to you, do you think that intellectuals and journalists must continue in their undertaking despite any circumstances, obstacles, um, or impediments? And no matter how much threatened uh, he or she could be, I cannot um, give you actually um, an answer saying yes or no. I, no one can decide for anyone else. No one can decide for the threat that anyone else can take. It would be unethical to actually lecture anyone um, or to, uh, to lecture any intellectual who is under pressure while I'm sitting in Hamra Street or behind my office in Ashrafi. Of course, uh, the personal circumstances of every individual exceed any consideration, and only this person can know to what extent he would like to go further. I can give you an example. Today, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary um, of the assassination of Samir Qasir. Many persons actually praise uh, the um, bravoure and the courage of uh, Samir Qasir in terms of writing. We never use the term martyr in Samir Qasir Foundation. Samir Qasir was assassinated. The martyr for us in our foundation is a person who is aware of the risks and who actually took um, steps 
towards death in order to um, in order to actually serve a specific cause. Whereas a person who is assassinated, such as Samir Qasir, is a person who wanted to go meet him with uh, his friends in any um, in any day of the week and who was killed. When we use the word martyr, it's as if uh, we are giving importance to the person who is uh, losing his life. This person didn't want to die. This person wanted to continue writing. This person wanted to continue living and loving. So did he, act, did he actually balance between the threats and did he continue despite the threats? Maybe he continued his work, however, he never uh, said that he is going to um, uh, actually face uh, the threat um, to life. And I do not know Samir in person, but all the persons um, who knew him and knew that he was reckless. Uh, to answer as well the question that you have raised, um, there is a question that could be a Lebanese cliché to actually quote from the uh, Rahbani uh, brothers because they had uh, some cliches and there is a sentence that was said I believe in Yaisha Aisha which says um, that um, um, is uh, the price that is paid for people is it more expensive uh, than the people themselves um, the, your life as individuals who are living could be more important than the cause per se but at the same time I understand that a person when he sleeps at night asks himself or herself the question he could for example decide that the cause for which I am fighting is more important than uh, me and the person who says uh, that um, uh, what is paid for in terms of people is not more expensive than the people themselves is someone uh, that we need as well to understand and we are supposed as well to defend the freedom of choice uh, for any of um, those persons. Now, if you allow me, I have uh, the last question to Nada, and then I shall open the floor for debate. Nada, of course, there are some winnings. Uh, this is what we had mentioned in terms of the freedom of expression. According to you, do you believe that those are uh, continuous um, winnings? Or there are some that we shall not use despite any, um, any threat? Now, the question that you raised in your invite is, um, um, uh, can we still now talk about um, uh, freedom? I wish to comment on what was said uh, by Amar. If we actually examine freedom of expression and if we inventory the situation, we see that it has relapsed. Um, Samir Asir stayed in Lebanon and he wrote from Lebanon. Would have been, would it have been the same impact if he had gone to Paris and written uh, those editorials? I'm not sure. I think that there is a dimension that is related to the courage of that person and to the expression of the reality he or she are encountering. Now, if the Reuters photographer uh, takes pictures of the violations committed by Jabhat al-Nusra and um, interviews um, a woman who says, I stand against an niqab, would he still be a photographer of, of Reuters or would he be added to the list of people who have been kidnapped and disappeared, among which, um, of course, we have some activists um, who are working with the revolution and who have actually archived and documented uh, the violations. There is actually a photographer here now in Lebanon. Can he, for example, have um, a, uh, a, a documentary uh, about the violations that have been that have been committed um, uh, 30 years ago, for example, by the Kataib or by the Lebanese forces? I think that you understood my point, um, Nada says. I'm simply stating facts. I know, um, are, there, are there any foreigners going now to Syria? To what extent were people actually enthusiastic about going into the land of the opposition? Do we still have people among uh, the uh, foreign journalists going to Syria? No, because there is a risk, there is a threat, which answers the question that you have asked um, Ayman. At any price? No. As a journalist, the first thing that you learn, and this is something, of course, uh, that you might disagree with me, um, about the news that you are covering must not be your last coverage news. Let us be realistic. We are no supermen. We cannot do anything, go to the front, and God is protecting us. No, we need to think about ourselves. It shouldn't be our last um, coverage. And this is what is happening. This is why many people are actually relapsing from the coverage. Maybe we could disagree about the quantity, about uh, the freedom of expression, but we cannot disagree um, that uh, free expressions have increased during the past uh, four years. These expressions, or whatever we have won during the four past years, will we lose them? or will there be any permanent winnings? Um, no, of course not. You will not use them. You are building. But we are not um, an isolated island. 
this is our work as journalists. This is not an island that is actually isolated from what we are doing. So we cannot assess the development of our profession without actually assessing the geographic location where we are working. You can, for example, such as Anna Baladi, a magazine that I am following, and here, of course, I'm doing no advertising, such as Anna Baladi was published from inside, is now published from outside with a few coverage from inside. This is, of course, builds for the future. However, if um, the media is to remain a diaspora media, then we will not have the same Anna Baladi that was published from Daraya. Anna Baladi from Istanbul is not Anna Baladi from Daraya. That's why assessing the extent to which we are building is related to the reality that we are going through. Our reality is relapsing. I do not see any horizon for the freedom of expression, and uh, all Arab countries are in the tunnel. Look at uh, Egypt, look at uh, Libya, the number of uh, journalists who have been assassinated. You had someone that was working in Libya. You had a lady from Ireland who was taking interest in Libya. The same goes for Yemen, even in Jordan. In Jordan. That is why discussing freedom of expression is not actually in an island that is free from any reality. I agree with what Nada is saying regarding the importance of relating to the area. It's only when uh, it's only, um, uh, for example, in skies, we have no statistics similar to uh, any statistics that are prepared by, for example, um, journalists without borders. It's not because we cannot do this, um, but because any information that is built only on statistics is weak. And uh, I believe that Lebanon and Jordan is, um, is an example. I'm not giving the example of Syria because it's a conflict country. Uh, Lebanon is a country where we have, of course, the most um, freedom of expression, uh, eloquent freedom of expression in the Arab world. However, the number of violations are the most um, important in Lebanon in terms of uh, physical aggression. And all this is taking place in Lebanon. Despite the situation, we have a larger margin of maneuver. Jordan is uh, the country where the less or a number or where the least number of violations are committed. Self-censorship is exercised to the extent that there is own, no need uh, to have any threat or to have uh, any complaint or any aggression. So in terms of uh, figures, uh, Jordan could be actually um, maybe an ideal country that could be as ideal as Denmark in terms of freedom of expression. However, we know that uh, practically there is not one sentence that could be actually said in Jordan. So I believe that uh, geography is very important. And we must not only examine figures. Uh, here stands the importance of understanding how the laws function, how intelligence functions especially when we talk about the freedom of expression. Between the 90s and 2011, Syria was among the countries where no um, arrest, um, except for the Kurdish region, says, um, uh, says Ayman. So let's open the floor for debate. Yes, sir. A microphone, please. Regarding um, the issue of the martyr in Arabic and, uh, the, and, the, and the issue of the martyr is very limited. So I think that uh, we uh, could may maybe mention the word shaheed in Arabic for the persons who have been assassinated by, uh, by injustice, maybe because um, he was killed by coincidence. So I think that we have to find a term in Arabic that is the equivalent of martyr in English and that is not shaheed. Regarding the freedom of expression, I think that it is very important um, not to examine uh, that freedom from a Lebanese perspective because in Lebanon, freedom of expression is nice, but that's it, which means that truth is not leading to any uh, social changes. And the main reason is that um, since it's a confessional state, then we have um, self-protection for the freedom from a confessional perspective. It is true that um, 
when talking, uh, people are not actually asked whether they are Catholics, um, Orthodox, or Sunnis. However, practically, he or she would feel that his own community is protecting him in a way or another. The freedom of expression is not uh, related to um, the real vivid democracy or freedom of democracy. And therefore, you cannot take um, the example of Beirut, though it's one of the nicest the Arab countries. And I think that the word nice could apply much more than uh, the word free. It's nice because people can say what they want anywhere, anytime, and no one listens to anyone or no one responds to anyone. So it's fine. Some people will say that uh, the freedom of expression has been kidnapped, abducted um, uh, as a result of the um, exceptional conditional situation. I think, at least from a personal perspective, that I am threatened by uh, the ambiance that you had depicted, uh, the ambiance of freedom. I am frightened um, of this ambiance um, much more than the lack of freedom because one person is saying Allah is with me and this is why I can beat you to death whereas the other would say I could be very bad however you'll have to cope with me you'll have to live with me I exist and I am stronger than you are so there is a difference in terms of the perspective or of the rationale one person is going to paradise and the other one is going that even if I go to fire I am stronger than you Please introduce yourself so that people can understand you. Uh, one last point. I think that freedom of expression shall be coupled with all freedoms taken all together. To have uh, people seek um, freedom at school, in the household, in political undertakings. And when you have uh, freedom of expression is actually coupled with all those freedoms it's only then that we can have a comprehensive scenario when we talk about freedom of um, expression apart from any other uh, freedom then it is um, insufficient i personally think that freedom of expression hasn't improved in syria it has regressed um, because there is more fear even if uh, there is no one uh, actually um, imposing censorship or oppressing against you are afraid that someone would kill you. So it's no longer related to the authorities. Someone could, uh, for example, commit revenge because he can uh, or she can no longer. Please introduce yourself so that my name is Sami Khiami. Thank you. I agree with you, says Mrs. Nada, regarding freedom and the relationship with democracy. True because we have freedom, but we do not have democracy. This is what Salim al has said. In Lebanon, we have many freedoms, and we have only a few democracy, because freedom doesn't change anything. You can actually publish a document about a former minister who wishes to kill all ministers during the months of Ramadan, and he could be well connected to the sheikhs, and stay at home. So I think that this is the main problem, not only in Lebanon. This is actually the new trend of democracy and the freedom, the changes that are um, uh, that are actually registered here yeah, as much as you want, but uh, say nothing. Regarding um, your comment uh, pertaining to the word shaheed in Arabic or Malta in English, sometimes you are using the word shaheed. It's as if a person is actually honored, as if a person is honored um, in his martyrdom. This uh, actually grandiose event, whereas um, a person is honored when the killer is actually arrested and he is brought before justice. This is how we can honor the person who has been killed. I agree, everything, I agree on everything that you said regarding to freedom and democracy. So the killer needs to be held accountable no matter who the killer is. A second issue pertaining Lebanon and the change. It's true. Of course, uh, major things are not uh, changing, though we have a small margin of freedom. But I do not want to be unfair. Because there are some matters that are not believed to be strategic, that are not related to the mechanism of the regime. The freedom of expression is enabling, of course, a small, um, a small actually breakthrough in terms of some issues. Now, the social approach regarding violence against women is different 
different than it used to be five years ago, and were it not for the role that was played by the media in addition to the civil society, then I think that we would have been still at um, uh, um, old ages. Uh, regarding, for example, the right of uh, homosexuals, of course, uh, things have evolved as well. And even conservative uh, media has um, uh, developed. There are some matters on which um, we can shed the light by understanding the factors uh, for a breakthrough and that could be used in more important issues. And this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. I would like to say to Dr. Sami that I totally agree with you that the freedom of expression needs to go hand in hand with other types of freedoms. And here, of course, I would like to focus on one point, um, saying that freedom is not um, uh, something accessory. There is um, a book um, published by President Chirac. President Chirac was paying a visit to um, Tunisian opponents under the Ben Ali regime, and he told them the following. You are complaining that you do not have freedom of expression. However, you are living in a country where you have economic growth on a yearly basis, and you have, of course, the freedom of having work, of having a home, and of having food on the table, as well as a job. So freedom of expression is a luxury, as um, quoting, quoting President Chirac. So one of the opponents says, yes, Mr. President, but it's the freedom of expression is the one that enables me to claim the right to the house that I want to build. The freedom of expression is the freedom that we seek in order to ensure that all other rights are protected. So when they speak about the freedom of expression is not necessary today for your people, I always focus on this quote from the famous book. And um, today you said that there, there is more fear today than before. Personally, I think that with regards to journalists and regards to the people who used to know um, what um, detentions um, used to look like, maybe we have 100 or 200,000 pe people who are detained and people and their parents only would like to know what the, what they have become. Uh, this is not a um, strange story or an extraordinary story. If this is not fear for you, then I am afraid of this much more than from a um, any other bu bullet. Another question, maybe? In your thoughts on to what extent I mean, you guys have framed this a lot in, in these very uh, absolute and very broad terms, which I think are interesting as Blame well. Reem. Huh? Blame Reem for the broad well, questions. Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. Any, anyway, those are, I think those are very interesting observations on the regional particularities of media, free spread, pr press, the debate between exiles and, and local authenticity. I'm interested, though, in, in where you sense movement, especially in the last four years, if there's been any movement, in where the red lines are on what people are willing to say. Uh, and, and by people, I mean journalists and also public speakers. Uh, so for a second, step back from whether this has changed power in politics, OK? I, I don't know any society, including uh, in Europe or America, where free speech translates into better government directly. Uh, so holding off on that for a second, do you see uh, areas uh, where that's happened, whether it's in Syria or Libya or Yemen in, in the crucible of war, or even in Lebanon, which has been uh, more or less at peace, uh, and, and what causes those shifts when they do happen, those improvements, if you see them as improvements. Thank you. Thank you. As we bit the Arabic. Are you talking about improvements? Kindly answer in Arabic, says we. I have just expressed myself. I said that we are in a regression and not in any evolution. We have the impression that we are evolving because I'm not saying that what we had before is better. However, things are not developing, are not improving. We are changing and we are putting an end to outrageous regimes, to regimes that um, look uh, quite similar, that uh, are oppressive. We are talking about a chaos. We are talking about a chaos that is oppressive uh, of opinions, that is actually uh, more militarized. And 
we can see, of course, all the communitarian oppositions. There is a demographic um, selection. And there are th some things that, that I hope will change in our days. We're talking about Lebanon and Syria. According to monitoring and control in Lebanon, there is a positive, um, a positive, of course, a breakthrough in terms of discussing some taboos. However, what's negative? Um, that we have some new taboos. Now, for example, the army has become a red line. No, but it has been a red line uh, in the law ever since. Yes, but maybe during, of course, uh, the uh, s uh, maybe during the period where we used them uh, to be under the Syrian um, presence, and today, of course, um, the challenges that are raised by the army are different. Um, um, in the past, of course, uh, the army used to be similar to a municipality police, um, but now today, with the arising um, problems on the frontiers, the situation is uh, changing. Even when the army is committing mistakes, uh, criticism has become uh, more difficult, um, and we must not forget um, the digital number in which you are living that is related of course uh, to the censorship of what's um, being displayed on the internet um, yesterday the American Congress has voted a new law on that perspective since um, we do not have any legal framework that governs expression on the internet and what uh, the state can control over the internet in our countries then it's very difficult uh, to have things actually go out of hand um, and uh, to go out of the good governance hands um, and um, to have um, the uh, authorities actually invading our privacy. In Syria, and here, of course, I have one comment, uh, which is accepting the opinion of others. I personally believe that whether or not we have a relapse or um, a development in terms of freedom of expression in Syria, what I am witnessing, unfortunately, is actually a relapse in terms of accepting the opinion of uh, um, any or accepting any different opinion, even among the opposition. I do not want to give a more... Um, about uh, more uh, more um, details, we had um, actually a meeting uh, revolving on that matter on arts um, during the Syrian revolution. Uh, the uh, speeches that were made by some uh, speakers that could have been invited uh, to take um, uh, the floor and who are all from the opposition, uh, the insults among themselves were actually outrageous in terms of accepting the opinion of that other. Some, of course, are related to a political stand, but some others are related, and I would like to say this honestly, however, uh, no no matter how much I fear it, are related, of course, to the funding of artistic and journalistic undertakings, and which is actually causing sensitivities in the public opinion. To go back to the question regarding Syria, of course, the liberated areas or the areas that are controlled by rebels, we must not forget that we are still in the revolution. We, can, we are still at the dawn of this revolution or this rebellion, any uh, similar uh, rebellion could take 30, 40, or 50 years. So if after two or three years, um, we can say that what we had before um, is better, it will be actually a bottleneck, and it will be killing a bo uh, and uh, to have a revolution that is born dead. Most rebels um, are, of course, um, controlled by the uh, one god, one political party, one approach. And this, of course, requires some time before we um, turn the page and before we uh, start with any other undertakings. Today in Syria, red lines are represented by the religion. No need to go into further details. However, with the free army or with the armed groups on the ground, one can actually mention many issues. However, red lines are pertaining sometimes to the sources of funding, to um, connections with um, foreign countries, if any, or the connection with the former regime, which has become a taboo, knowing that um, Every group had its own relationship with the re with um, the uh, with the regime. It's as if everybody was born in March 2011 and wasn't born before. So uh, these are things um, that we needed to fight against, and we need to seek what's best. I think Reem says that, that after a couple of years, after a few generations, when you um, uh, muzzle the uh, voices of people, it's very difficult from the beginning and from the outburst to have them actually accept or embrace uh, the opinion of others. I do. Um, I am in, I, I do agree with what you are saying, Ayman, in terms of um, the funding. Do we have any other intervention or question 
two more interventions. I mean, something huge has changed. We live in this region. We, we consume the things that are written. We see many, many people writing things uh, in every country that I pay attention to that nobody was writing before 2011. Okay, and we see information from places controlled by Daesh and places controlled by Nusra and places <coughs> controlled by, by dictatorial regimes, places that, that we didn't know simple facts about four years ago, five years ago. Uh, not that it's utopia, but I mean, any conversation about freedom of expression that doesn't take that into account, and you don't have to, I'm not saying like it or don't like it or think it's great, but, but the description, especially now that your description, <coughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me as a fitting with those, that data. It might be worse. You might, you might be right that it's worse, that it's a regression, and, and I'm interested in hearing that, but, but your, your, your characterization has to take into account that real change in words and information coming from Arab journalists, non-Arab journalists, foreign journalists operating in these, in these deadly places. Um, and, 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 I, and I do think that, that you must, as a, as a journalist working here, see some kind of change as well in the culture of your colleagues or their expectations of what they can do and how to do it. Um, another intervention maybe before we listen to the speakers. I would like to have your opinion. To what extent um, do you think that during the past four years the opinion and the opinion of uh, the other has contributed in falsifying and in diluting um, the ethical approach that needs to be implemented when we talk about uh, the uh, when we talk about the cause of the Syrian and uh, his cause. To what extent it has been falsified in the name of that opinion and the counter opinion? Can you clarify, says Mrs. Nada? This is actually something uh, where the regime had played an enormous role. We have actually this movement of the freedom of expression, and that is embraced by many persons, and uh, that they had manipulated in the media, and the written, and in the audiovisual media, and in the streets. There has been actually several claims regarding uh, that embracing the opinion of that other is uh, compulsory, n though this um, position could be unethical under the pretext of the freedom of expression. And this is something that the regime had contributed to. And this is actually behind the violence that is exercised by many persons, because, of course, this opinion is mainly based on denying my right in my righteous cause. So it's very important to understand where this violence is coming from. Of course, I cannot um, be um, uh, on the same table with a person that is rejecting my right to life under the pretext of um, uh, the right to um, arts, uh, to right to uh, intellect, um, and then I'm accused of being violent, of rejecting the opinion of others, and of being against the freedom of expression. To comment. Mr. Sam, on what Mr. Sami says uh, regarding um, the issue of Allah, I think that Bashar al-Assad is the first one to have said that, that um, uh, the um, powers of nature and the powers of Allah stand uh, in his favor. Before we go back uh, to your uh, intervention, we have to listen to the last intervention. Since I am Syrian, the main purpose of the whole revolution, before we talk about the freedom of expression now, people were actually seeking the right of expression, which hasn't uh, translated into tangible reality. We are all uh, working towards achieving this goal, and we are still looking for a freedom of expression. We still, we still haven't actually gone into the discussion of whether or not we have a freedom of expression. And this will not happen. Um, in the blink of an eye. I have a free expression that we didn't have before, but the freedom of expression requires a lot of efforts. So what we are saying is that we need to seek freedom of expression. 
when we have freedom of expression, then we have a person that is expressing himself. I can give you the example only of Syria. We have Syrians who are expressing themselves in different ways. And when there is actually a way to express themselves, they are irrespective of the price. I can simply share with you, of course, the extent of oppression that was exercised in the past. I could go crazy. I could have my leg cut. So in Syria, we are still working towards having a freedom of expression. The freedom of expression and the freedom of change are um, intrinsically related because it's a symbiosis, it's an organic relationship. Freedom of expression relates to changes. If you have changes, you have more freedom of expression. So it's actually a relationship um, that, uh, that goes crescendo. Changes have not occurred yet in Syria. To have changes, we can start discussing, of course, some details pertaining to freedom of expression, but we still haven't reached change. Thank you, Ammar. To comment on what Sana said, of course, I believe that there is a huge misunderstanding of freedom of expression. I was at a TV debate. And I had a person sitting in front of me saying, you are saying that there are some airplanes bombing Aleppo. This is your point of view. However, what I'm saying is that President Bashar al-Assad was a young and excellent president that was very loved. And the, the Emir of Qatar um, uh, was actually jealous and decided actually to break the neck of Syria. This is my opinion. This is my point of view. I told him, I'm sorry, what I'm saying is actually a truth. It's not a point of view. I'm saying that Aleppo is being bombed, and I'm saying that uh, uh, residential areas are being bombed. It's not my point of view, because I woke up in the morning in France or Beirut to relate to this fact. Um, and this is a situation. And then uh, when you say that President Bashar al-Assad was very nice and was very interesting, this is not something true. This is actually um, a lie uh, to say as well that uh, the, uh, the Emir of Qatar had decided uh, once uh, upon a day to actually break uh, Syria. I agree with you on this. However, we need to, to see who is the culprit. It's the media that is playing this role. Here we are moving to a different issue, which is related to professionalism. Professionalism is not actually to host um, people, to have uh, someone who can have uh, some inspiration in the morning and to have in front of him a physics or a physics expert or a physician. Here, of course, we have an ethical issue with uh, the media and with professionalism at this media. So let us, of course, uh, remedy the problem. The issue is not uh, the misuse of the freedom of expression. The problem is that we have uh, uh, media institutions that um, are totally unprofessional and that need at least uh, to uh, scrutinize the information. As long as we do not have any scrutiny, uh, as long as we do not uh, scrutinize information, then of course uh, the role is not existent. So let us, of course, point a finger of accusation towards the media who are mis. Uh, or who are abusing, of course, um, of the rights. This is related, of course, to how to educate and to cultivate uh, the people. But once again, it's not a, a crisis with the freedom of expression or the freedom of uh, or the freedom, but it's an unprofessionalism. I think that what you have mentioned is a very sensitive and a very true issue because we journalists suffer from this problem. It is related to the opinion and to the opinion of the other. I do not know what the answer is. What if uh, the truth is not objective? So what can I do? I cannot, of course, uh, hold a balanced um, uh, approach. And here, of course, I agree with Ayman, not only with regards um, the accuracy, but I agree with him um, on matters pertaining to the role of the media enterprise and the journalist who doesn't want his institution to become a platform for lies, for example. And here, of course, uh, we are uh, preaching no lessons. Uh, we can give uh, many examples. There are some presidents who have committed crimes and who have been hosted by international organizations. And we have seen how journalists have brought uh, pictures and articles which means that you have given, of course, uh, one hour and a half of time, and you have prepared yourself, and you have, of course, provided the information and the documentation, which means that you have attenuating um, the opinion of that other because uh, you had expressed such an opinion. And this is something that I totally agree with you, and uh, that will not be solved. I think that any newspaper anywhere in uh, the world is may not be very, uh, may not be very uh, impartial. It's not a matter of um, 
an ethical approach. It's about the law and about censorship, because if we do not have a censorship system, then ethics alone cannot be upheld. I stand with them against pre-censorship, because who will exercise a pre-censorship? Irrespective of the country, pre-censorship is actually a visa to oppression. If it's by means of the people who have enough awareness, one of the most important pre um, spokesperson at uh, NBC or um, had covered or who had lied about the coverage of some wars. Here we can see how professional coverage um, or censorship can actually play an important role. So the question, as a journalist in many media institutions, the question is um, to be objective means uh, to actually uh, give uh, 30 minutes uh, to the uh, criminal and 30 minutes to the uh, victim and then let the audience decide. But this question hasn't been raised in many institutions. So it's all related to the content. The last two interventions, because we are running out of time. Microphone, please. I wish to raise a point that is more important than freedom of expression, which is inclusivity. Are we a people that have decided to be included or excluded in the world? Are we a people that is worthy of living and of freedom, or are we people but why are we to decide what they want to say about us? It is up to us to decide. Yes, but uh, the world is actually governed by some people who think that we have two peaks in the world. We have the West and we have maybe East Asia. What stands in between is a valley. This valley is us. They still have not decided to tell us anything, because if they had decided, then we wouldn't have had wars, because wars hap would have happened in Tanzania. We have been listening about people talking about the West, about the conspiracy theory. I can tell you that in the 300 um, TV um, encounters, in Europe, um, no one actually focused on human rights. Um, they were saying, die. We are not waiting for them. We are trying to see to what extent uh, their opinions are affecting us, which means that we are the problem. If you understand that issue, and in the event of any war, and um, if half the people in Syria, of course, we have the right of society. It's not only the right of the regime or of the opposition. It is actually a social war, half the community, regardless of whether they like it or not. So half of the community is afraid from the other half, and the other half is afraid of the first half. And this is the case for every evolution, Reem says. This is what happened in every conflict and in every revolution where we have different parties involved. So the freedom of expression and objectivity will be without values, which means that you are supposed to remedy the main problem. Honestly, there is no main problem. There are many problems that we need to remedy, and today, we are talking about freedom of expression, and we are living in a country where we have freedom of expression, and this is why we are capable of discussing these matters. Please, please, we still have the last five minutes, the last intervention. Yes, the last intervention, please. Do you have? My name is Amal Qasim. I'm Syrian from um, Damascus. What do you think is 
the right step to be taken. As a country, as a human being, as a project, for Syria, for the region, how can I change the region? Especially that now we are in the midst of the war. There is no tangible result on the ground. So the last question, which means you have to summarize. I give no lessons to anyone. We need to continue in terms of creativity, in terms of productivity, but as well in terms of training and professionalism. They can go hand in hand, freedom of expression with the training and professionalism, and every country will produce um, the result of such activities, especially in our regions. I do not think that um, in my age, in my experience, or in my country, I can give lessons to anyone. Thank you. Concluding remarks from Nada. No, I have no lessons. I have no lessons or just one concluding remark. Things are more complex uh, if, uh, if only they were related to us, to our expressions, to our capacities. Because, as I have said, they are related to where we are working, uh, to uh, the regime, whether or not we are enabled uh, to do this. So it doesn't start with us. We are part of an entity. Thank you, Ammar. Concluding remarks. I have no lessons uh, to give. Um, but when I hear the young persons on the ground in Aleppo talking, I think that the example to which they aspire, though it is not actually my example, especially with the freedom of expression where we had many problems, I think that we might look at the example of Turkey, which is the, the country that is closest to us and that has or provides a, largest, uh, or a large margin of a freedom. I'm just um, relating to what you're saying. This is the country that um, has the largest number of imprisoned journalists. It's enough to mention the Armenian genocide. This is why they do not want to give you any examples. It is for this reason that no one wants to tell you what is the step, because every person, there is nothing um, that is perfect. As Nada said, we have a specific geography. Maybe we would have wanted to be in Denmark because it's one of the most important countries in terms of individual freedoms. It is very obvious that even if we spend another one or two hours, we'll have a lot to say. And um, we have live screening and a translation that have to end now. So this is why I would like to thank you for being with us. Thank you, Zico. Thank you, Eri Galwa, Patrick. And uh, thank you for our panelists, um, uh, Ayman, Nada, and Amar. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you.